I can't give a great introduction other than uh, Seafood Watch, and he's going to tell us all this cool stuff about uh, Seafood Watch. Yeah, so I'll, I'll introduce myself a little. I'm Kyle, <laughs> I'm Kyle Edson. I've been with the aquarium for almost seven years now, um, and I've been with Seafood Watch the, the entire time. So I'll, I'll do, hopefully this will be more of a you know conversation in the end. I'll try to keep the, the presentation somewhat short to give you an overview of kind of what we're doing and the scope of the work as it's expanded beyond pocket guides in the app and a little bit of my specific role doing monitoring and evaluation. My formal title is business intelligence manager, which is data. That sounds management. important. That sounds it's, really important. Yeah, most people probably don't <laughs> know what business intelligence is yet. It's, it's taking mostly large data sets and turning it into like interactive dashboards and information that leadership can use to make adaptive management decisions. Like our, our strategy is actually having the effect on the world that we're intending them to. And if not, we should shift our resources to more effective approaches. So we're trying to kind of use um, the information we have at our fingertips and have had for a while to actually understand like where should our next report like if we're going to write something um, new have a new rating or a new a new like farm assessed um, where should that be what are the highest priority unrated um, production areas that are you know uh, of concern for us so I'll, I'll jump into a first a little quick intro into like what seafood watch actually is and where, when we started so um, we started in about 1999 which is two years after the aquarium itself started sourcing only sustainable seafood for its on-site dining and animal feed operations. Um, so uh, what happened is we had a, a temporary exhibit called uh, Fishing for Solutions, where we talked about the differing impacts of different fishing practices and the environmental sustainability of the, the you know, products that those fisheries um, catch. And so we had these little tents, these little uh, table tents, little cards that we would put so that the diners could know you're eating this kind of cod from this area of the world and this is how sustainable we, we suspect it is. Um, but it was a very kind of high level analysis. We weren't getting that deep and doing um, real research. It was, it was um, a more light touch approach at that point. But uh, some aquarium staff noticed that a lot of those table cards were getting taken by the diners at the end of their meal and brought home so they would have the information in their pocket as to what they were eating and so they could you know, we assumed to buy it again or have that information easily accessible. So that's what started the pocket guide idea. They, they said, well, we could do this a little in a little more systematic way for a lot more products on the U.S. market, like shrimp and salmon and tuna and things that are very popular and just consolidate it down to a really simple guide that people could carry with them when they're shopping. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the vision was that the, the market pressure that that would generate would cause retailers and restaurants to start thinking about sustainable seafood because enough people are asking for it. Um, and that would just kind of push its way up the supply chain and eventually get to producers and, and they would feel the market pressure coming from the US or, or markets that we influence um, so that they could improve their production practices and, and get better access to some of the um, businesses and consumers that we've worked with. Um, so like all of this is basically founded on our, our science-based, really in-depth peer-reviewed um, assessments, our reports that are effectively you know, 50 to 100 page white papers that we have a fleet of analysts write for us. None of the staff actually do the work, um, but they, um, they uh, you know, basically consolidate all of the relevant, most up-to-date information and compare uh, the information they're gathering to our standards, which are quantitative and scored, and they um, basically produce the, the best choice good alternative and avoid rating at the end of that assessment process. They just, there's, um, um, a platform that we use online that helps write and generate the PDFs and it scores everything automatically. So there's no interpretation really. The interpretation is built into the standard itself and the analysts are just plugging in variables that are relevant and the calculations are done in the back end. So, you know, best choice is, is our kind of buy uh, name. So we want people to, um, you know, prefer to buy best choice options if they can find them in, in the stores. I think good alternative is you know, better than red, but there's still some concerns about the environmental performance of those operations. So um, that should be your second choice. And then avoid is basically don't buy. There's serious concerns with bycatch or habitat impacts or poor management. Um, and we, we don't want to support those fisheries. So it is basically an economic model. We're trying to apply market pressure to influence the environmental performance of these, of these fisheries and farms. Um, so you might have seen in the news recently, we downgraded the American lobster fisheries on the east coast of the U.S. And that got a lot of uh, blowback for us and governors calling Julie Packard and um, lots of angry emails and news articles and things um, because they were you know upset about the environmental or sorry the economic impact of that rating and we we're not we're not in the mark we're not in the business of trying to take 
you know, in, income from people. But um, there is that is kind of the model we're we're building on. Is, is like if, if you aren't um, if you're in this case if they're if they're causing the decline of uh, critically endangered North Atlantic right whales, there has to be a an issue like a penalty for that. And if we can't in good conscience rate them as yellow or green and encourage people to buy those when there's 60 whales in the wild left and if we don't do something quick you know they're not going to be around in a decade so so we have to kind of deal with that red ratings get us a lot of heat sometimes other times nobody seems to care because <laughs> their consumers don't care they haven't even heard of us so there's there's you know um, a kind of a very widespread of results that we're getting from these things and we're trying to kind of hone that in and, and do reports and ratings on on really important products where we actually have influence and our business partners have influence otherwise it's a moot report that kind of nobody nobody actually reads or listens to um, so uh, before I jump to that what I do uh, is support uh, amongst other things the monitoring and evaluation of seafood watch and that's where we are or some people call it monitoring evaluation and learning where we're trying to track all the work that we're doing and figure out how effective it is or not and make adjustments um, so it's something that a lot of funders and a lot of nonprofits have it's kind of in vogue right now because they're giving us millions of dollars a year to do certain work and they want to make sure that it's doing the job that it's expected to and it's on a, a certain timeline and that mm -hmm. um, the outcomes are realized so we're starting to get better and better at tracking these sorts of things and it all started with this, you don't have to read any of the details. This is just a conceptual model. Um, it's a very complex network of all of the influencing factors that we could brainstorm on sticky notes on a wall over the course of a couple of months. If ultimately our goal here is to improve the sustainability of global fisheries and aquaculture and marine and freshwater systems for both habitat and species, um, what, what are the upstream effects that would, would lead to more or less sustainable production? So we just mapped this out as best we could and did arrows and double-headed arrows and um, everything from it's difficult to implement or there's greenwashing, there's general public engagement and knowledge, business practices, the economics of seafood fishing in general, like uh, um, just waste over consumption, a, a market for cheap seafood, everything we could think of. And then we try to build it all together to figure out where do we actually fit into this network of it, where, where's our influence focused. And there's engagement science here the business program there and, and just trying to kind of get a sense of the whole landscape of, of sustainable seafood and uh, and where our strategies slot in. And from that, we build a theory of change in a program called Marathi, which is just uh, basically a series of if-then statements where we, we are laying out our assumptions. If we um, engage with, say, like key audiences are, the key audiences are reached with an appropriate message. What happens if people listen to us and, and, and take, it, take us seriously? Well, and may, maybe sustainable seafood issue salience is ma maintained within the US public. Um, and if that happens, uh, you know, maybe major buyers implement some commitments because they're feeling that market pressure from consumers. So we just did the same thing, but now we're talking about like, if we do this, what do we expect to happen? And if that happens, what do we expect to happen? Um, so. We can, um, we can build uh, this model to help us understand what our actual objectives are in each of these areas. And ultimately we identify very important assumptions that we have to make sure are valid or the whole thing falls apart. Like if our red rating in this next one, like we do the same thing for, we, we do an assessment, the rating is red. What happens, to, what do we think